Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. I often get students tell me, I reached a certain position in the game, and I didn't know what to do. What do you think my answer is to that? Well, believe it or not, my answer is good. If you always had positions where you always knew what to do, it probably wouldn't be chess. It would be more like a game like tic-tac-toe where I could give you a 10 minute lesson on tic-tac-toe and then you would never lose a game because you'd always know what to do. Well, how many tic-tac-toe coaches are there? And the answer is not many because if you always know what to do, then the game's no fun and nobody's gonna play it. So not knowing what to do is actually good. Now, then I say, all right, let's change your question a little bit. Instead of saying you didn't know what to do, you reached a position where you couldn't figure out what it is that you wanted to do. Not being able to figure out what you want to do is a lot different than not knowing what you want to do. Just like in knowledge, knowing, uh, memorizing an opening and memorizing an end game is a lot different than being able to calculate and figure out and through analysis and evaluation what your best move is. So it's one thing to not know what to do. It's another thing to not be able to figure out what to do. So let's take a look at a game I played about 20 years ago. And let's take a couple of positions during the game and let's see if we can apply a, you know, don't know what to do. Let's say you're black in this position like I was and you're trying to figure out what to do and you just can't figure out what to do. All right, so, so the first step in figuring out what to do is always to try to figure out what both sides are trying to accomplish. Now you might say, well, that's silly because what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to do are the same thing. All right, well, there's some truth to that, but what I'm really saying is if you don't know what both sides are trying to do, you don't know what your candidate moves are because a candidate move is a move that does something, and generally when, when it does something, that means it either helps you accomplish something you're trying to do or it prevents him from doing something that he wants to do. So those would be what the candidate moves are, are trying to do. All right, so in this position, let's take a look at what both sides are trying to do. Well. In the opening of the game, and this is still in the opening because we can tell because not all the pieces are activated, you're trying to activate your pieces. So in this position, White's trying to get those two rooks doing something, and White's trying to get his two rooks doing something, and also his queen bishop. All right, how about the pawn structure? Well, right now we have a closed pawn structure. That means we pretty much want to have most of our pieces behind our pawns, and we might want to look for playing some sort of break move to open up lines for the pieces. Right now, for instance, there's no open or semi-open files. That's why it's a closed position. And therefore, the rooks need something to do. So, for instance, white might be looking at a move like f4 to try to break open the f file for his f rook. That explains why he played a couple moves ago, knight on f3 to h4. He not only wanted to be able to play f4, but he wanted to discourage Black from playing f5 to activate his f8 rook because if Black should now play f5, it's not safe. White will play knight takes g6, not only winning a pawn, but forking the queen and the rook on f8. All right, so what are some of the things that Black might be looking to do here? Well, let's say he's looking to develop the bishop. Notice a lot of the squares you develop the bishop on have a problem. Bishop h3 isn't safe. Bishop g5 is just hanging out there on the other side of the board and he can start attacking it with his pawns and the bishop would have to go back. Bishop f5 would allow white to trade that knight on the rim for the bishop. And not only that, right now, black has the advantage of the bishop pair, which is worth about a half a pawn. He certainly doesn't want to just give it back. It's not so much that bishop f5 would double black's pawns on the f-file. It's not so much that bishop f5 would allow white to semi-open the g-file and attack the king it's that he would lose the bishop pair and he really wouldn't get much of anything for it. So bishop f5 doesn't look so good. Now what about bishop d7 and bishop e6? Well notice they both block the knight's retreat squares. So if I play bishop e6 here, then white could play a move like b4 and attack that nice knight on c5 and the knight couldn't go to e6 which might be its best square and then maybe to d4 or something like that. So bishop e6 would block the knight. Now this should trigger other ideas in your mind, like, well, if bishop e6 allows black, white to play b4 and attack the knight, maybe we should play a move like a5 
to discourage white from playing b4. So now we're getting some ideas of what you want to do when you're trying to figure out what to do. If you don't know what to do, you're trying to figure out what are both sides doing. Well, that knight on c5 is pretty good, so it makes sense that white might want to drive it away with a pawn. So you either want to fix it so he can't do that, or if he does, make sure the knight has a good place to go. So these are all things to do. So normally, lower rated players might not think of a5 as being a candidate move here, or maybe very low players might think they're going to play a5 to activate their rook. But really, the idea of a5 is to just protect that knight on c5 so that white can't easily play b4. Then you would start thinking, but what if white just plays then a3 followed by b4? If a5, a3, black could play a4, and then pawn on a4 is guarded twice with the rook on a8 and the knight on c5. It's attacked twice with the knight on c3 and the queen on c2. But if white now plays b4, then black can play a takes b3 on passant and win a pawn. So we're looking at the line a5, a3, a4, and now white can't play b4 because of Ampassan. So that tells us that a5 is not only a candidate move, but it's a candidate move that is probably going to be a final candidate move. Well, we also said that maybe black would like to activate that rook on f8. If he wants to activate the rook on f8 and would like to play f5 and get his pawn chain rolling, then his, the problem is his pawn is hanging on g6. So here, a move like king to h7 to guard the pawn on g6 so you could play f5 also becomes a candidate because it's what we want to do. We want to activate our pieces, and f5 activates the rook, but right now f5 is not safe. Is there any other way to do that? Well, yeah, we could play g5. If we play g5 and hit the knight, the knight can't go to f5 because bishop takes f5. It would probably go back to f3. Then white could play, black could play f5, or black could even play bishop f5 and attack the diagonal where the queen is. You like to put pieces on the same lines with the queen. So for instance, the, the black bishop on f5 would serve some purpose of discouraging that d pawn from moving in the future. And similarly, if we move the bishop on c8, we might want to put a rook on c8, which is the same line as the queen. And then later on, if the if the pawns start being traded, like with if black later plays bishop e6 and d5 and they trade pawns, c takes d, c takes d, the c file becomes open and then the rook against the queen becomes a factor. So this is a position where we're trying to figure out what to do. So we've got candidate moves, we've got g5, we've got bishop e6, we've got bishop d7, we've got a5, we've got king h7. These are all candidate moves. What else could we do? Well, I guess we could play bishop f6 and attack the knight, but then after the knight goes back to f3, what is the bishop on f6 doing? It's just blocking that f pawn, and it really doesn't have any future there. So I would say bishop f6 would be more in that don't know what to do, don't do that category. So we're using our ideas of the position to try to figure out what it is that we're trying to do. And the ultimate goal here is to just activate more pieces. We're not trying to checkmate white. We're not trying to win his queen. You know, it's not that kind of position. I guess I should add that if you don't know what to do and one side or the other has a tactic, then everything else kind of falls into place, meaning you really don't have to care about the other. Like right now, suppose white had a big threat to fork the queen and the rook or something like that then black has to put off his development for a move. He has to stop white's tactic. Or here, if black had a tactic, if he could sacrifice his knight and then get uh, a knight back later and win a pawn or something, then we're trying to make that tactic work. That's what we're trying to do. So whenever someone says to me, I don't know what to do, I always say, well, if either side has a tactic, then you know what to do. It's either stop their tactics or execute your own tactics. If you're in the opening and you don't know what to do, then there's something wrong because you should know what to do. What you want to do is activate all your pieces. And here, all of Black's pieces are not activated, so that makes it relatively easy for what to do. All right, let's go forward a few moves and let's do the same exercise again and pretend we don't know what to do. Let's see what I played. I have no idea. I don't remember this game that well. This is now Black's 12th move. I played Knight to E6 right away. I would think that's not the top move by the engine because looking at it right now, I don't quite 
think that that's the right idea. Let's look at the top three moves, top four moves. There's that move A5 we talked about. There's that move G5 we talked about. There's the move Bishop E6 we talked about. And fourth is the move that I actually chose, Knight E6. So I actually think my discussion about what to do led to better moves than actually what I did in the game. How much time did I take? Wow, I took seven minutes. Shows you I must have not fully known what to do either. So I obviously considered all these things, but I picked the move that was at best the fourth best move. All right, let's, let's follow in the game then. Let's turn off the engine. We don't want the engine telling us what to do. Then we can't talk about what, what to do when you don't know what to do. All right, so I played knight e6, threatening knight d4. My opponent played e3. I played king h7. Well, we talked about that move. That move was to stop knight takes g6 so I could push the pawn. White played b4 to keep the knight out of that square and also to just gain space on the queen side. I played bishop d7 just to get the bishop out of the back rank and get my pieces, uh, my rooks coordinated. Also, if he plays b5, I'll be protecting the pawn on c6. White played rook on a to b1. And now I did play f5 to activate the other rook. And he played b5. Okay, let's do this position then. All right, both sides have done some of the things they wanted to do. The rooks are more active. White has gotten his pawns moving on the queen side with some space. All right, so White has just played b5, and we, we don't know what to do. That's the premise of the video. All right, we don't know what to do. Well, first we have to check to see if he has a tactic. If he takes on c6, and black takes back with the pawn or the bishop, the pawn on c6 is guarded, but the b file is not contested. So White has a little bit of a positional threat to semi-open the b-file with b takes c6 and then have his rook control the file. So what can black do about that? Well, black could put a rook on b8 himself. He could ignore it and let the rook poss possibly come to b7, but the rook really can't get to b7 in every line. If b takes c6, bishop takes c6, then if bishop takes c6, b takes c6, the queen would be guarding b7. The problem with that is after b takes c6, b takes c6, or sorry, after b takes c6, bishop takes c6, the d5 square is weak and white can pop a knight into knight d5, hitting the queen, and the only way we could get rid of that knight right away would be to take it with the bishop, and that would lose the bishop pair and make the white squares really, really weak, and then the bishop on d5 would be hitting the rook on b8. That's just not good stuff, so... If, black, if white ever takes that pawn on, B, on c6, black would probably want to take back with the pawn, and that means the rook's going to have access to b7. So if you're not sure what to do here, you have to do a little analysis and figure out what your opponent is threatening. So white has a mild threat, not to win material, not to mess up my position, but he has a threat maybe to trade pawns, and if I take with the bishop, I might lose the bishop pair. If I take with the pawn, he gets a rook to the seventh rank, which is annoying. So that's kind of a threat. What could we do about it? Well, we could counterattack him. We could play g5. If we counterattack the knight and the knight goes back to f6, then his bishop isn't hitting those squares on the, on the queen side, and I might be able to play bishop takes c6 in some lines. Um, what else could black do? He could play g5. He could play a, move a rook, let's say the a rook, to b8. If we play the a rook to b8, white could play queen a4 and hit our a pawn, which is a little annoying. You're always analyzing to figure out what to do. You can't just figure out what to do in a, in a vacuum. You can come up with a plan and come up with some ideas of what to do, but if the move sequences don't support it, then it's not going to work. As Jeremy Silman said, in order to have a plan, it has to be both feasible and effective. So if you can find moves that your opponent can play that will make your plan ineffective, or even infeasible, then you're going to have to reject that idea. Okay, so we're trying to figure out what black can do here. Can black ignore it? Well, we already ignored it with g5. We already ignored b takes c6 with g5. How about pushing past and playing c5? Well, no, then he has bishop takes b7. Let's cross c5 off our candidate list. Also, that gives the white knight the d5 square. Don't like that at all. 
So c5 is not a good way to do it. Can we play d5 to block the bishop? No, white has one, two, three pieces guarding d5. Black only has one. d5 is not safe. Doesn't look like we can play it. All right, anything else that uh, black can do? Well, he could bring the knight back to c5 again now that the pawn has passed it, and that would guard the b7 square. So that if knight c5, then b takes c, b takes c, rook c7 is not possible. In that position, white could play d4 and try to get rid of the knight, but black has two pieces guarding d4 after knight c5, b takes c, b takes c, d4. Black can play e takes d4, e takes d4, bishop takes d4, winning a pawn. I don't think white would have enough compensation for the pawn there. So knight c5 becomes an idea. It's an idea we weren't thinking about before because we brought the knight back. But now returning it to c5 becomes an idea. So we still have the idea of putting a rook, maybe rook on f or b or a to b8. Uh, we can't play b6 because then our c6 square isn't guarded enough. We could guard c6 again with a rook or a queen or a knight. We could play knight to d8 or something, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so again, we don't know what to do, but we think black has, a, white has a little bit of a, notice when white has a little bit of a threat, we sort of know what to do. We, we're trying to either stop the threat or neutralize the threat. Or we could counterattack. We could ignore the threat and do something we think is even better. That's why I mentioned maybe play g5. Another problem with g5 is it weakens the diagonal between the black king and the white queen. So that later on, if white plays d4, the f5 pawn becomes pinned to the king. That's probably not what we want to do. Could we ignore his attack with a move like f4? f4 is an interesting move. f4, b takes c, b takes c, rook to b7, and then can we play f3? And the answer is no. He's got a knight on it. He's got a bishop on it. We can't play g5 and get rid of his knight. Then he has d4 check or just knight f3. So f4 is an interesting move, but I don't think it's really what we want to do. So again, we don't know what to do. What is he trying to do? What are we trying to do? Do we want to stop him? Do we want to help ourselves? You know, in this case, white has a little bit of a positional threat. So it kind of helps us figure out what to do. We kind of want to keep an eye on that b7 square. We could move our bishop somewhere, e8 or c8. We, if we go to c8, then we lose the c pawn, so we can't do that. Bishop e8 seems a little silly. Um, Let's take a look at that rook ab8 line again. Rook ab8, queen a4. How do we save that pawn? We, if we put the rook back on a8, then he plays he plays uh, b takes c, b takes c, rook to b7, pinning the bishop, hitting the a pawn. Oh, that looks very, very bad. If rook ab8, queen a4, a6, he just takes it off and wins a pawn. So um, suppose you look at rook ab8 and you think that solves my problem and you don't look at queen a4 and then you play rook ab8 and he plays queen a4 and you go, uh-oh, what do I do now? That's hope chess. Hope chess is where you make a move and you don't look at your opponent's chess captures and threats on the next move and when, then when they can do something, you think, uh-oh, what do I do now? So I'm pretty sure rook ab8 is not the best move. Uh, knight c5 is still a candidate. Not a bad candidate. Um, rook on f to b8 is probably safe. g5 to get the knight back to f3 so he's not hitting the c, the bishop's not hitting the c6 square makes sense. Um, could I play g5 followed by f4? Again, I have the problem that he has a discovered check with d4 check. Um, not quite sure I really want to play g5 unless it's just to stop it. So knight c5 looks like a possibility. Um, rook f b8 I really don't want to play. Can't play c5 as I said, losing the b pawn. Can't play d5, loses the d pawn. I don't see how I can easily ignore him. So I'm leaning toward 
maybe something like knight c5 here. But again, you know, do I know what to do? No, I don't know what to do. I'm just trying to, to uh, you know, possibly meet things. Bishop to e8, guards g6, the queen guards b7, it disconnects my rooks. Not sure I really want to put my bishop back on e8. So I'm guessing something like knight c5, rook fb8. Um, can I take the pawn first? C takes b5. C takes b5. My b pawn is hanging. I don't think he can take it right away because then rook a b8 hits the bishop. And eh, that's probably okay for white. He could also take back on b5 with a knight. Or if I take on b5, he could even play knight d5 first and then take c takes b5. And I don't think that's very good for black. I want to keep a pawn on c6 in this position. All right, so again, I don't know what to do. Let's hit the button and see what the top three, four are. The engine says bishop e8 is possible. It says after bishop e8, black's a little better. Doesn't like knight to c5 as much. Bishop f6 counterattacking the knight is there. Queen f6, not sure what that does. Maybe it threatens e4, threatening the knight on c3. Rook f7 just to guard the rank. And he says on rook f7 that white shouldn't trade the pawns. That's interesting. I would have thought on rook f7 that c takes b takes c, b takes c, rook b7 would be annoying. Let's take a look at that just for the fun of it. Rook f7. See, pawn takes is not one of his top moves here. Let's see why. Pawn takes, maybe because I can play knight c5 after. Pawn takes, let's say he plays rook to b7, knight c5. If he tries to keep the rook on the seventh rank, let's see, queen d8 doesn't work. I'm not quite sure why. Let's take a look at queen d8. Ooh, he can sack the exchange with bishop c6. Hitting, oh, not second exchange, hitting my rook. And if I move the rook, he can play rook takes a7. So there's a tactic there. So the engine wants black to play queen to e8 and neutralize the seventh rank with the rook. Interesting. That's not a line that I considered. So I certainly didn't know what to do there. All right, let's go back. Let's turn off the engine, go back to the game. So in the game, let's see what I played. We'll do it one more time, really quickly this time. What did I play in the game? After b5, I played knight c5. See, ungreat minds think alike or something. He played rook fd1. I played e4. He played d takes c4. I played bishop takes c3. And he sacked material with e takes f5. Wow, just to create fun. So I guarded my bishop with queen f6. He played f takes g6 check. I played king to g7. So he's got a bunch of pawns for his piece. He plays b takes c6, b takes c6. And now he sacks more. He plays rook takes d6. Okay, my opponent's playing very aggressively here. Fun game. If I try to not take the rook and play queen e5, he can always attack the queen with the pawn or the knight or something. So I had to take it. He took check. I put the queen in the way. I'm up a rook for a bunch of pawns. Do you, would you like to trade? He says, no way, Jose. If you take my queen, then I will take back with the pawn. And he did, I did play queen takes queen. He played pawn takes queen. Okay, let's just quickly do this position where I think I made a really good move. All right, what's white trying to do? Well, let's assume we don't know what to do for black. White's trying to take my knight with a pawn. And that would leave him down the exchange, but he would have seven pawns and I'd only have three, so he'd have three pawns for the exchange. What should I do? Well, if I move the knight, 
he's going to play rook to b7, hitting my bishop, which isn't guarded. And then if I guard the bishop, he's going to play like bishop takes c6, winning another pawn and threatening my bishop, which is going to be hard to defend. So I've got a big problem here in that he's threatening to take my knight. And if I move the knight, rook to b7 followed by bishop c6 could be winning the game for him. But I'm up a whole rook for a bunch of pawns. What can I do? Well, it turns out maybe I can sacrifice the knight and remain up the exchange if I can win enough pawns for it. So I think the right idea here is not to save the knight. It's to give him the knight and neutralize his attack. So probably something like rook a b8. And then my rook is going to be a monster on the queen. If he doesn't trade rooks, then I can save the knight and I'm up a whole rook. But if he trades rooks and takes the knight, then my rook can like check on b1. If he plays bishop f1, I can play bishop h3, threatening rook takes f1 mate. If he plays knight g2, his pieces are all tied up and maybe my rook can win his queenside pawns. And then I can win the end game even though he's up in material. All right, so that's my move, rook a, b8. Let's see if the engine agrees that rook a, b8 is the best move. Engine says, you bet, Dan. You got to put a rook on b8 or you're not going to win. Let's see what happened in the game. I found the right move, rook a, b8. See here, it's much more tactical. Rook a, b8. He played rook takes b8, trying to win the knight. Otherwise, I'll move the knight. Rook takes b8. I, I sacrificed that knight back so I could... Play rook b1 check. He plays bishop f1. I play bishop h3. He has to play knight g2 to stop the mate. And now I got a whole bunch of tempos. The pawn on g6 is a goner. There's no rush to take it. So I simply played rook to a1. Thank you for the pawn. He, play, he has to untangle himself here. He plays f3 so his king can try to come out. At this point, I said, all right, let me win that A pawn with check. I'll take the knight first before he can get in the game. King takes. Rook takes A2 check. He gets out of the check. And now I just move my rook over here so his bishop has no moves to come to the queen side. And now my threat is to just queen the A pawn in the next five moves. And look at that bishop. There's really no sequence of moves that bishop can make that's safe that would allow him to stop me from queening. And meanwhile, his threat to push his pawns is easily stopped by my king. So my opponent, who's a A player, fairly strong player, you know, he recognizes what I was doing with the move rook d2 and he resigned. All right, so today's video was don't know what to do. You got to figure out what both sides are trying to do. If somebody's doing a tactic, that makes the answer easy. But we're assuming they don't have a tactic. And in two of the three positions we looked at, there was no tactic. There was just some positional ideas. So hopefully this will give you some ideas of what you do when you don't know what to do. Try to figure out some imbalances between the two sides. What are both sides trying to accomplish? What are the moves that make sense to do that? So we're trying to look at how to get... For instance, one of the things you can do is find your worst piece and make it better. There you go. There's something you can always do. Find your worst piece, make it better. All right. Hopefully you enjoyed today's video for my YouTube channel. If you haven't told people about it, please do tell people about Dan Heisman Chess. If you haven't subscribed, you can. You can like the video. We'll see you next time. Bye.